Thank you, Kieran, and uh, uh, thanks to Mori and uh, Arm for, and BIA for um, uh, setting that up for, for us. Um, so here we are, um, uh, Catapult and Chiesi following GE and uh, uh, GSK. So this is from gorillas to gazelles, I guess. So uh, here you go. I'm, I'm not sure everybody knows uh, uh, Chiesi as a pharmaceutical company. Chiesi's um, uh, mid-sized pharmaceutical company. It's actually now the 40th largest in the world. Yep. Sales of uh, 1.4 billion uh, euros, so a little less than the uh, you know 40 billion um, um, at GSK. But it's been growing terrifically, yep. double-digit growth uh, in the UK, um, and still family-owned, family-operated. So it's quite a, a different setup, really, for um, uh, for yourself, Diego. I mean, you you're the uh, project leader for uh, advanced therapies. You're involved in the development and commercialization um, uh, of them. Can you tell me a little bit about, you know, how how you personally got into it, and uh, then uh, maybe about how um, how Chiesi has walked forward and and started to get such a good reputation in the area? Well, yeah, I th in a, in a way, I think uh, uh, it was partially by chance. So it was, uh, it was a few years ago when uh, I was in the company and I was mainly working in uh, looking for in licensing opportunities. And the company was at that point quite open to, be, to do a big jump in a new direction. So we were looking what was out there, mainly for rare diseases and specialty care. And we both, myself and the company, uh, started to see a number of uh, game-changing products that were out there and they were all in the space of, um, of advanced therapy. So uh, we started understanding that there is something really new, exciting, probably a bit magic, yes, and in this field and, and that if we want to do a big jump over a long-term future, this is the way to go. And at the same time, we were also approached uh, um, by some scientists in a very close by university in Modena who had this uh, wonderful um, capability to grow uh, epithelial stem cells in culture. And they had already done, done it for a number of diseases, but mainly for ocular burns where uh, the burn uh, um, destroys the, the, the surface of the eye to a level that the epithelial stem cells are lost and they could take a biopsy from the other eye, grow it in culture, substitute uh, the tissue, and it stayed there for 10 years at that point. It treated already 200 patients. So we decided to do spin-off there, but also to reinforce uh, this sector with partnership, licensing in, and now we are also thinking about growing something <coughs> internally. Yeah, so, so it's really, really interesting that KZ got, got into that technology in a way because there were quite a few academic units uh, and, and clinical academic units around the world pre-ATMP yep. regs doing this sort of stuff. In fact, when I used to run the blood service, we, we, we were doing that as well. Uh, and, you know, not a lot of intellectual property uh, in the, you know, not much in the way of patents, and yet you committed to do this um, and to turn an academic product yeah. into a registrable product. And, um, you know, everyone was watching this really closely and asking technical questions. Will the regulators let the animal components through? Yeah. All of those things were solved. Uh, can, you, can you kind of give me some of the highlights of the blow-by-blow -blow accounts of getting, it, getting that academic product turned yeah. into Holoclar? Well, I think that uh, the choice of that specific product was not by chance. Uh -huh. Because, um, as I said, they had already significant clinical experience in several centers, all in Italy, but in several centers. So there were all the right seeds, in a way, to, to grow something pharmaceutically and to skip some of the steps that we knew were the, the, the most difficult, like the preclinical development. 
we basically uh, were able to cut out most of the free clinical development due to the fact that there were already plenty of clinical data out there. And some of them, uh, and this was another important element, some of them were collected, already thinking at future publications, yeah. future studies. Right. So we were able to retrieve that level of quality that was the ground for a pharmaceutical development. Uh, we knew since the beginning that uh, the uh, traditional way to protect uh, intellectual value of this product was limited. Uh, but we knew since the beginning that the step change that you need to bring an academic product to an industrial product is not something that uh, uh, you know, every company would do. It's not something that every company would do in, a, in, a, in a such a rare disease. So we don't really fear the, the issue of genetication. Now, then, there is also an, another type of uh, uh, competition, which is from these exact old products still made yeah, into yeah, hospitals, yeah. but that's, a, let's say, a different and very complicated story. But in, in the future going on, I think that the, especially in, on, in terms of protecting intellectual property, it will not be probably only by patent. Well, it's, all, it's an it's open disease, not. so you, you have some exclusivity. You have, you have exclusivity, yeah. But, yeah. but you have also to build a way to use your product. So you have to generate a, a new paradigm in patient care. And this is also part of the protection in a way. Yeah. So, you, you know, you're, you're starting, the world's on its head here, isn't it? Because, yeah. you know, tra a traditional uh, pharmaceutical development pathway goes through a milestone process of, of development. Um, uh, but what you're saying is you're starting with a product you knew worked, and it was just a kind of a blow-by-blow -blow account of how you get it um, industrialized and yep. through that process. So the clinical efficacy was, you know, I, I'm always shouted at by my, my senior team for saying um, it's a banker, but it really was a banker, this one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Tell, tell, tell us a little bit about the kind of, um, it's an autologous product. Yep. You, you're one of the first to market with an autologous um, uh, product, certainly uh, in the ophthalmic space anyway. Yep. Um, tell us a little bit about you know, your thoughts and how you're overcoming issues like very short shelf life and um, uh, new clinical pathways for, for, for this? Well, I, in fact, uh, I mean, I think you touched the, one of the most vital issues and most critical issues. Uh, the, the, the probably uh, where these products are reach their maximum level of complexity is not even in the development of regulatory in logistics, yeah. and I, I do agree. Uh, 36 hour is really the limit uh, to be able to apply, at least for European territory, uh, something relatively similar to a traditional distribution where you have one manufacturer in place and the product is moved somewhere else for the treatment of the patients. If you have even shorter you know, shelf life, then you have to start re-engineering the way of getting the patient probably closer to the manufacturing site. So in our case, 36 hour living tissue, room temperature uh, shipment, of course, not going outside the boundaries of 15 to 30 degrees. And uh, we do it with uh, um, a dedicated uh, shipment throughout Europe to specific treatment centers. And this is, I think it's the key. So you have to engineer the logistics for every single treatment center. So it's not something that you can do in every hospital. You can do in every hospital even because Handling the product requires some training and, and knowledge, but also because you cannot reach every hospital. So the, what we are envisaging is two, three uh, treatment centers per large countries, and let's say one treatment center in the smaller ones right. Um, right. with a reasonable logistic. And then absolutely nailing down the logistics. Yeah. So that's a complete shift from you know, traditional small molecules, pharmaceutical wholesalers, socking in Absolutely. pharmacies. So this is a, one of the, the examples of the, yep. the, the new paradigm, if you like. Okay, very good, very good. And um, so have you settled on a kind of pricing and commercial strategy around this? Well, we, or is it just we are doing days? That's, yeah. that's a bit early, but we are starting the discussion with several agencies around Europe and also on the price. Okay, okay, good. So, 
So we'll probably come back to holoclore a little later yep. again, um, and uh, the relationship with with um, you know the hollow stem and, yeah. and, and what have you. But maybe now we can move on to um, the other the other major area yep. for you, at least at the moment, which is uh, gene therapies, in vivo gene therapies, and the relationship with um, uh, Unicure. I mean, the first product that. Um, first gene therapy that's recognized as an advanced therapy produced by Unicu uh, Unicure and um, um, the commercial deals yours. Can you tell me a little bit about that strategic relationship, how you got into it, and, yep. uh, and, and where you see it going? Well, but once again, the, the way we got into it was in that same period of evaluating other opportunities we were external to the company and trying to look with the same eye as or all of them to something that uh, had um, industrial chance of success. Right. And I think what we found in, uh, in Unicure was a solidity and scalability of the manufacturing process, which was something that I have to say we saw many, many opportunities. And uh, this was something completely lacking in many wonderful scientifically wonderful opportunities, but with little industrial chances. Yeah, I, I, did a, I, I did a fireside chat in San Diego uh, a few weeks ago with Johan Aldo, the CEO, okay. and he, he prides the kind of manufacturing muscle that, that, that he has. And of course, you've got um, a desire and a commercial reach yes. that he hasn't. So that sounds an, you know, a really good combination. Yeah, it, it was actually. And uh -huh. uh, so that we started this, uh, this partnership, which is around the basically two, two main products. One is, of course, Calibera, and the other one is a phase one uh, product for Hemophilia B, which is yeah. also yeah. an extremely exciting product. Yeah, I mean, and, and, and there you've got two scales, potential scales of operation, one an ultra uh, orphan um, uh, lipase um, storage yep. de uh, deficiency, uh, and, and Hemophilia B, which is yep. a really, really big one. So, um, um, you know, there's no doubt that um, Unicor uh, and PEZ could address the scale of Libera, but what about the scale of Haemophilia B? I mean, you know, it's only phase one now, but it could, uh, if, it, if, it, if it goes well, it could go really fast. So yep. you might be looking down, it would be a good problem to have, but you might be looking down the barrel of a, how do I roll this out on scale? So Well, uh, absolutely, absolutely. This is uh, totally true. This is probably more of a question for my friend Alec from <laughs> Unicurus. Um, here, but uh, yeah, but even, I, I even on your end of it, the no, scale no, on our of end, the kind sure, of treatment from, and delivery. From a treatment, from a treatment yeah. side, is a um, is really in in a way a game changer, and we are very happy that this is down the road uh, after Glybera, after Oloclar, so we can also learn how to address this scale. But uh, um, I think that in a way, um, the Hemophilia B product is. Uh, somehow easier from from this point of view because there are hemophilia experts out there. There are hemophilia centers. Uh, you can okay. select your partners. The logistics is easier uh, than a, an autologous um, living tissue. So I think we you could apply something in between the traditional pharmaceutical model and uh, a really um, network of excellence type of. Model for so, so, so in many respects, the, these kind of um, the, these treatments are more like the kind of what we would class the allogeneic, the traditional yes. pharma model. You know, the, the actual challenges are different. Yes. But of course, one of the challenges, one of the great expectations is, is because going back to Glybera, yep. it's transformative. Um, uh, you've gone to Germany uh, with orphan status to try and roll it out. You treated yep. the first patient. Yes. There's a price. I think the list price is forty-one thousand dollars a vial. Correct. Um, Twenty vials a patient, maybe. What are so lessons? there's a big number. Can you can you kind of uh, well, uh, give us a sense of um, how those kind of commercial discussions have gone? Well, I think that uh, uh, I would not totally agree that it is a big number. It looks like a big number. I agree on that. Yeah. Uh, it's not in a way that, uh, I mean, if you, if you think about gene therapy, I mean, you, I think you should have to take a step back. What, what is a gene therapy in that case? In that case is substituting a non-working gene, which at the end is um, substituting a non-working protein somehow. Yeah. So if you take the, the first benchmark you can get, uh, which is protein replacement in other 
ultra rare diseases. And the first one that I have in my mind is uh, enzyme replacement therapy for lysosomal storage disorders. That's, uh, and you get the price of that uh, type of treatment for an average weight patient. So that's something, well, roughly ballpark. 150 to 400 K per year, right. more or less, depending right. on you know the, the type of product, et cetera, et cetera. But that is that ballpark area. And well, for, with Glibra, we have six year data now. So we are able to show a 50% decrease in pancreatitis event after six year from treatment. Uh, so if you multiply that by six years, and it's not that six year at the end of the effect, is the end of what we can demonstrate because we have six year follow up. Yeah. Uh, but if you multiply that for five and six, then what you get is well, 500 to 2 millions, that yeah. area. Yeah. So I, I think that we have to start thinking in a way, in a different way. These treatments are one-off, as we heard before, and, but their effect will last for years, maybe decades. Um, so we have to think of what is the long-term advantage that the, the, the society and the payer has. Plus, there is another important element which is never, which is not really touched upon many times, which is the budget impact for the payer. Uh -huh. The budget impact is extremely less yeah. than the one for chronic treatment. Because in a way, you start treating prevalent cases, then especially for rare, ultra rare diseases, you end up in a situation where you don't have any new prevalent cases. And you go with incident cases. So the, the shape of the sales is completely different for us, but also the way the payer, um, in a way, uh, manage this cost is completely different. And for a product, it could last five, ten years, and then stop having the bulk of cost associated with that product. Uh -huh. Whereas for a traditional pharma product, that's not the case. The cost will be dealt forever, in a way, because then you have a plateau, a peak, uh -huh. and then you maybe have, you know, Genetics or other other ways to decrease the price, but what you don't see is a limited time frame for cost, and then a much lower cost in the future. And this is something that should be taken into account. So it's in, it's interesting, isn't it? Because you know, you, you, you often find people are quite resistant to um, formal health economic analysis for. Um, for, for traditional pharmaceuticals, yep. whereas you could turn it on its head and say, well, proper health economic analysis, and we find NICE is very receptive to this um, uh, analysis, and we, we, we hope there'll be some more publications coming out soon, that actually demonstrate that there is that value there. Yep. Um, and do, do you, do you, have, you, have you used those arguments constructively in that dialogue with, with the payers? Yeah, oh, well, we, for sure, we uh, were building uh, our position around that also, considering also Oloclar, which is, is probably an easier case from, yeah. from this point of view. Glybira is a complicated case from that because of the number of patients that were enrolled in clinical trials, yeah. and because of we don't have today any easy to use biomarker or <coughs> some uh, easy to use measure uh, to, to support that. So what we have is a striking decrease in, in the number of pancreatitis in the overall population. So it's a very, in a way, it's a complicated case for that. So probably not the best case to discuss that. Uh, we might have a better case in Oloclar where you have, you know, the, the, the improvement in visual acuity. And uh, so it's, you know, what much easier to do, to do that, much easier, not really much, but easier to do that. Right. So we will mainly do probably that around, uh, around Oloclar and other products. Then, of course, the, the new one in the pipeline, Hemophilia B with Unicure and other that we are uh, thinking about, they do have, since the beginning, this thinking <laughs> inside, and uh, which was not really possible to do it with all of them. But, but, but Glybera, you know, that, that kind of paves, the, blazes the trail for other products, you know, it shows the safety and you can kind of do yep. that. So even, even though the total um, revenue might, might be generated is, is going to be modest, it, yeah. it really helps these follow-on products. Is, is absolutely. That, yeah. That's absolutely. Yeah. This is a way to learn. In a way, it's also a gym for everybody. Uh -huh. It was a gym for regulators, it was a gym for Unicure, it's a gym for us. It's probably, I hope, it's going to be a gym for the payers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so um, you know, they're the ones that, that are most obvious. T t tell me a little bit about the other research interests of yep. um, 
of EAZ in, in, in advanced therapies? Yes, in a way we, uh, we decided to you know, start very diversified in terms of type of products, but also in terms of relationship, you know, uh -huh. so from academic to industrial. We're now refocusing our interest. I think it's the time to uh, decide which platforms, which type of uh, relationship we want to have. So probably in the future, we will have uh, other products coming from Allostem, which will be the main internal products, so all based on epithelial uh, stem cells, potentially also genetically modified, and here we have a... Allogeneic? Uh, well, we, not, from, from not from that platform, but we are adding also some potential allogeneic component. Okay. Uh, so a new allogeneic platform that we are studying internally, but it's very early stage. And then we will continue uh, in vivo gene therapy, but only with collaborations like the one we have. Right. With Unicure, not, not with an internal development. Right, right. And you're interested in EB, is that, uh, yep. is that something you want well, to talk that's, about? Well, that's, uh, that's part of the pipeline from Allostem. They have a series of oh, products okay. they are developing, and the idea is they develop up to a certain stage, and then we get in and we continue the development. But the EB is probably the most interesting one. They, for whoever does not know, a, a EB is, stands for Epidemiologic Bullosa, which is a rare and completely devastating skin disease in which um, patients lack uh, um, one type of collagen, and so the <coughs> epidermis is practically detached from the derma. So whatever happens will, you know, blister the skin and generate ulcers. So this, uh, this is since birth onward, and these little babies cannot be hugged by their parents because otherwise they will, uh, they will basically destroy their skin by, by hugging, by taking them, by... And uh, it's totally devastating it's horrible, disease. It? Terrible yeah, it's horrible. Disease, yeah. And we had all STEM scientists had treated uh, uh, two patients. One six years ago, they substituted basically the the leg, taking of course a biopsy from from the skin, cultivating the the, um, the epidermal cells in 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 vitro, genetically modifying the cells and reattaching like a patchwork the the leg and. Uh, the skin of the leg is still there. Uh, it's now a new skin because you know, skin changes every two months practically. So six, six years have elapsed okay. and it's still there. No lesions, okay. no blistering. And, you, and you've almost got your own internal control because I guess the other leg's not treated. Yeah. So Absolutely. that patient's probably knocking on the door saying, do yes, the other one. Yes, he is, yeah. he is. And we are yeah. trying to understand how to satisfy him and oh, a really long number of patients. Because one of the, I mean, I know EB quite well. Yeah. Um, one of the things about the etiology of the disease is that, is that the blisters are kind of coming and going all yeah. the time. But a whole leg as a control is a uh, is, is pretty, good, pretty yeah. good approach. Interesting. OK, I want to talk, uh, we're, we're almost out of time, but um, I want to talk very briefly about the kind of hospital exemption uh, mm. issue, which yeah. for those, of, those that don't know this, is a there's a, uh, as part of the ATMP regulations, hospital exemption is allowed, and this is a kind of valuable outlet for clinical research and uh, early development, but of course the clinical centers um, um, uh, that, that are doing this, meeting a, a treating unmet need, then, you know, face with a, uh, a product that becomes registered, which potentially puts yeah. that line of clinical application out, out of business. So can you tell me, how you're approaching that kind of difficult, uh, difficult issue in, in Europe? Well, it's, it's really a complicated issue also because it is um, uh, within uh, the European um, regulation that uh, the, the, the remit of how to apply hospital exemption is on a national level. So, uh, so EMA and um, uh, European regulators are out of the game is a game for any single country, and every single country has understood and implemented the, the rules for, for that in a completely different way. So let me be honest, uh, hospital exemption is a vital clause in the legislation. It is there for a serving a high ethical purpose, which is to try things like the one we, we heard in, in the last week. So in desperate cases, single patients that are not 
in if you know reached by any product, any clinical trial, anything, and you have the technology as an hospital to do something about it, you can do it. Yeah. And that's vital, I, I would say. Well, that's a completely different thing that substituting uh, approved products which are at pharmaceutical standard or subtracting patients from clinical trials. This, I think, is something that is an unethical use or commercially uh, not acceptable use of, uh, of this type of um, you know, legislation. Okay. And I think that, argue, that, that discussion is going to go on for, for the next several yes. years. So maybe we can just uh, finish by summarizing, if you can give your thoughts around the, um, the kind of the platforms that you're operating in and the kind of future for, yep. for KAZ, then we'll hand over to the next panel. Well, fantastic. Yes, uh, as we touched base before, um, we have this um, uh, platform in Allostem, which we'll exploit to the maximum extent, of course. There are many tissues that can be substituted and many rare and a little bit less rare diseases that can um, benefit of that. So the, the idea is to get uh, products like, a, like the one for EV inside the KZ pipeline. Then we have this um, interest for an internal allogenic platform and then we are open for collaboration on, uh, on other fields. Okay, so maybe in five years time, instead of me coming up here and talking to you about um, Chiesi being a 1.4 billion um, um, company with, with um, you know, a, a, an emerging interest in advanced therapies. Maybe it will be a 10 billion company where the traditional pharmaceutical products are the, in the minority. And 8.6 are coming from these products. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Okay, with that we'll wrap up. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.